All right, everyone, welcome to the show. Like I said in our intro, we have got someone here that I have huge respect for, um, deeply admire, really inspired by, and also someone that I love on a personal level. Uh, Kurt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ram. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You know, I have seen such a cool evolution from when I first like even became even aware of you and what you do musically to today. And there's so much that I could talk to you about today. Like, man, I think back to the first Converge 7-inch when I got it when I was really, really young to seeing you talk about the band and how the band evolved over time in zines to then, of course, getting to know you as we've recorded records together and just also watching you develop as a career and what I would say quite comfortably as, as really a leader in um, more of like how to produce things, how to be a really strong musician, how to write great records, but also, and the thing that always stands out to me about you and Converge is just being really ethical and smart about managing your business. From my perspective, what I know about the band from having spent a teeny little bit of time on the road with you, but also knowing you uh, all on a personal level, no matter how big you've gotten or how much money has been involved or how things have changed, you've always stayed a punk band, like a punk approach, DIY approach. Yet there's actually like really smart and ethical business that's been built up around the band. Was that something that just kind of happened over time? Like just like, oh yeah, we got there and just kind of naturally evolved. Or were there points where you started making very specific decisions on, on how you were going to manage yourselves as a band so that you stayed true to yourself? I don't think we've ever been particularly strategic about the business side of things with the band. I think the important thing to understand is that the music scene that we were involved in when we started in the early 90s, um, there just really was not anybody from outside that music scene that showed any interest in it from a business perspective. So if we wanted to accomplish anything, we really had to do it ourselves, which worked really well for me because I come from a family of self-employed people. And the idea of, you know, nobody else is going to care about your art more than you are. And nobody else is going to put as much time or effort or attention into the thing that moves you as you will yourself. I fell into this sort of this this lifestyle really really naturally and it came out of a, a love for the band a love for the music community and a love for the people that I met from being involved in it and the motivation comes from there as well and, and it still does and I think that all of the decisions we've made as a band both artistically and business-wise have been a reaction to that. I mean, we just want to make cool shit with our friends and that's the the most important thing. And so the the business goals is really come is really about like, you know, how can we best position ourselves to continue to do that for a long time because this is what we love to do. It's not about um it's not about achieving some sort of commercial success. While the, while there's nothing wrong with that, I've always felt as though if at least for me, if I were to attempt to succeed on a commercial scale, that, that seems like a recipe for failure to me. I think that music audiences, especially the kind of people that listen to our music, are, are really smart people, and they can, they can detect insincerity really quickly. And so the idea of being really opportunistic with, with music just has always left a bad taste in my mouth, and I've never wanted to approach anything in that way. Just, just, just realness and honesty are, are a currency that I value so much in what other people do. Um, so it's really important for me to do that in, in my own output. And I would say the guiding principle for me in, in all business and all art, all music, all of that stuff is to try to be the person, the artist, the engineer, that I would want as an outsider, as a, as a fan or as a listener, try to, be, try to be that thing that I would want, hold myself to those standards that I would want in someone that I was um, looking up to or I was buying music from or so forth and so on. I love that. And it, it's clear with the band. Um, it's just clear. And it's clear with God City and all the things that you've done. Like it comes from a place of like, oh no, like I actually care about this, but also I want to do it in a way where it's, accessible to people and it makes sense to people like yeah you know it's going to be my brand but 
you know, I, I want to make sure that when people are getting it, they have a, a good experience with the, that as well. And, you know, when I think about Converge, and, and of course, we're going to move on to all of the things that you do in, in a sec. But when I think about Converge, and I only mean this as a compliment, but like I think of Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington is like one of my favorites because no matter what role he's in, he's Denzel Washington. But he's like the coolest, like, you know, whatever movie he's in, he does it. And you're like totally believable, but it's also still him. And he's got this like feel about him as a as an actor that I just think is so awesome. But yeah. then he can go and do a role. It's just like Denzel Washington doing this, doing that, doing that. And I always kind of felt that about Converge. Sorry, go ahead. Well, that's interesting you say that. I actually have thought about that quite a bit. And there's some a lot of actors are afraid of becoming typecast. They go out of their way to not be typecast. And yet when you see Denzel Washington come on the screen or you see Arnold Schwarzenegger come on the screen or or, or you see you know, Bill Murray come on the screen, like the history of what they've done, their their collective body of work comes with them. And it, it already elevates that character as soon as you see them for the first time on that screen. Um, so I think that there is, while it may, while a certain degree of typecasting may sort of lock you into certain roles, at the same time, it can also be a strength. And I think that someone like Denzel uses that as a strength. Totally, man. And so like, I always looked at it as, yeah, you can be typecast if you kind of suck and you you know don't don't do the things that are going to help you grow in that space but you can also avoid that if you've just got a really good solid foundation and you use that to take risks like smart risks that you work hard at so if i go back to to converge you know if i think around you fail me i started feeling like a real shift in in things like of course jane doe was this like incredible groundbreaking record for you but around you fail me i started feeling like of course, you're always experimental, trying different things. But I started seeing like a real like drifting into different things that I just feel like as you've gone on, the band has been able to do. And just there are these moments where I'm like, damn, that sounds like a Nick Cave song. And that's amazing. It sounds so perfect. It's Converge channeling in these different things. I'd say with your latest record, like, man, I could just sit down and listen to tracks that I feel are, are almost like the least traditional Converge songs and still feel like that is 100% Converge. And that's an interesting, for me, an interesting evolution that you can still be as an artist and as a group of artists, exactly who you are while stretching your ability to do other things further and further. It's, it's pretty astounding. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because one of the uh, mission statements of Converge has always been creativity. But when you have been in the same band with the same four people, uh, or at least, well, the same four people since 2000, um, the same singer and, and I have been together since 1991. So when you've been in a, a group with the same group of people for that long, it's really hard to find new ways to create. So we're always kind of tricking ourselves into finding um, new ways to stay original, whether it's like changing the tuning of the guitar or, you know, this song starts with the drums instead of the guitar as, as the foundation of the idea. Or, you know, for this song, we're going to bring in a collaborator that's going to, you know, throw everything on its head. And there's all sorts of different tricks you can do. And, and I think we've done a pretty good job of finding new modes of working over the course of our career that's enabled us to continue to create different output with each record so let's hit though on longevity of relationship because that's a nice segue into that i mean you've been with jake the singer for a long time and of course and uh ben and nate for i guess what 21 years now yeah yeah nate even longer yeah of course yeah that's right that's wild though because you're also creating things and so like if i'm going to juxtapose this into the business world you've got teams who have like a nightmare scenario of staying intact for like three years that people are like, I hate, I hate working with my boss. And you know, you've got these real struggles of people staying together. And I know, of course, you're, you're four people and you know, um, I believe, yeah, everyone has families. Uh, mm -hmm. you're also four very different people. How have you managed the relationship management while still being creative and running it as a, as a, as a business. Cause like there's three things. It's like you're, you've got relationships and it's a business and you're a creative entity. And of course those things all merge, but they're also separate. So how have you been able to do that? Well, it's a uh, complicated question. Of course, um, I'll give you the least <laughs> complicated answer I can give you, um, which is that we all collectively love what we do. We're all, we all collectively love each other like brothers whatever little differences we have, the importance 
of what we do together to each of us as individuals makes it worthwhile to overcome whatever obstacles there are. So that's that's the sh- sort of the shortest answer. I'll also say that you know it did take some time in order to f- to find the right four people. You know, there were some other members earlier in the band, and um, you know, I've got great things to say about all those people. But you know, it took a little bit of time to find the exact four people who were just the right blend to make Converge what it became. And the other thing that I think that's really important um, in a band is if you want to keep the band together, you really have to share everything equally. Uh, so that, that that fairness within a band, that, that means sharing in the f- financial risks. That m- means sharing the financial reward. It also means that sharing in the responsibility and all the other work that goes along to it. So you know, each member of the band is contributing in their own ways. You know, for me, it's a lot of, you know, songwriting and recording and not so much on, you know, the other parts of the band, like the, the touring side of things. I, I, I mean, I go on tour, but I don't really do a lot of the, the work setting up that stuff and booking travel. And, you know, Jake, our singer, for example, he's a, he's a fantastic graphic artist. Uh, he's also runs a record label called Death Wish, and he releases a lot of our material and releases vinyl. Um, even though our primary record label is called Epitaph, Jake does a lot of, a lot of work, um, creation of the visuals for the album and the marketing and all that stuff. So, you know, we're all like kind of really involved in various aspects of the band and the fact that we have a trust for each other and also understand that if we don't get our way today, we'll probably get our own, our way tomorrow. And that every, not every decision made is the end of the world and it's okay to make a decision that you don't all agree upon and that you'll you'll get over it like you know whether it's like where are we going to go to lunch today or whether it's uh, are we going to do this chorus two times or four times or you know is the cover going to be black or is the cover going to be white all of these things are you know we're going to get plenty of opportunities to get our way over the over the history of the band so like not everything has to be like a knockdown drag out kind of fight that's something that you learn with experience and also the more records you make the the less every single little piece of minutia seems like the end of the world where you know like you know musician artist type people they they tend to be really emotional and they tend to be really passionate about their art and i've seen a lot of situations in my studio where you know bands were at each other's throats and you know every member of a band felt the need to micromanage every other member of the band because if they felt as though if they didn't do that then the other band member was going to ruin their record and that's not a f- fun way to make music. It's not a creative way to make music. It's not a rewarding way to make music. You know, so I'm, I feel very fortunate to have, you know, found a group of people that that I trust uh, to make music with that. And I, and I also trust that even when we disagree that we have the same end goals in mind. And it's not about anyone's ego. It's about achieving a collective goal, even if we have differences about how to get there. Yeah. I, I want to unpack that a little bit more though, because there's, there's a couple things that, that stand out to me. The, the first is like, when you talked about like the longevity, giving you that kind of perspective, keeping in mind, most bands, they don't have that longevity. Like for a lot of people, they're like, I'm going in to record this one LP. This might be my one shot at doing this in my life. Or I want to do this for the next five years and I need to have a great LP to do that. And the stakes can at least appear a lot higher to more inexperienced people yes, absolutely. and people who haven't had the length. So that's, a, that's an interesting piece for you. At what point in your, you know, musical evolution, did you actually hit that point where it's like, Oh no, like we actually have all the time in the world and it's going to be okay. So that perspective that you're talking about, when did you as an individual start getting there? I don't know if I've ever felt like I've had all the time in the world and everything is important of course, but I don't know that I really have a good good answer for that. I think it's been a, a, sl- a slow, steady shift and a slow process in letting go. And I think just if, um, from a personal level, over the past maybe 15 years or so, I've sort of gradually let go of the idea that the universe revolves around me. I'm an only child and I'm a musician. I'm an artist. Like it's pretty natural for people in you know in my position to kind of feel like the world revolves around them and i and i uh, have come to re- realize that it doesn't and as i've <laughs> slowly let go of that i think i've become a much happier person and in part of doing that is um realizing how much i love respect and trust the opinions of the people that i work with yeah and 
you know, just from like a personal reflection, I, I believe we got to know each other around like right aroundish when you fail me came out. I think it might've been like yeah. maybe a year afterwards. And even in the times where um, we were spending a lot of time together in communication a lot, I actually saw that shift from being more um, precious about things and like really like wanting things to be a certain way or having strong opinions to become a much more mellow person. But also in that time, I mean, the growth that you had as a you know, person, you know, of course, like going on to become, um, you know, have a partner and you know, family, successful businesses that you've started, you've also like gained in a lot of places that would build up someone's confidence. So it's a real interesting uh, situation because it's not just youth that would make people fo- like hyper-focused on that. I think it's that the world is a big place and I'm a small part of that. And, yeah. you know, if I want to, if I want to make things work, I have to make things work. Absolutely. I, th- it's, I think just all it comes down to life experience, you know, in, in my studio, I get to be sort of a, a fifth band member in a lot of projects. You know, I probably work on 40 or 50 records a year, you know, and in each of those cases, I become like a, a fifth band member to varying degrees. So I, I get to see the inner workings of a lot of bands, a lot of different styles, a lot of different ages and experience levels. And it's really important, you know, in this, which is my day job, to find my place in that and find when it's appropriate for me to insert my opinion and find when it's a appropriate for me to to not insert my opinion and, and find when it's appropriate for me to pick my battles around that specifically like what advice do you have or even just insights about in a sense as a producer and, and an engineer there is so much essentially what would be called like project management you know bringing together these incredibly creative people who are deeply passionate they want to get they want to get to the best result but of course not just creative people, but anyone who really believes in something and wants to create something can be an absolute nightmare and people can have huge fits, freak outs, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. So what are some of the, what's some advice that you have, or at least some insights in how to keep people unified towards a common goal, no matter what? The most important piece of advice I can give anyone in life is don't react right away. This is true for working with artists in a recording studio. This is true for commenting on things on the internet. This is true for being a parent and dealing with unruly children. It's true in other types of relationships. If you take a second, absorb the information that's been around, you take a beat and then choose to respond once you've once you've taken that beat rather than immediately and passionately it sort of temp- it tempers your um, your emotions a little bit and can make you a more rational and productive contributor to whatever's happening so in the studio something that happens a lot that engineers like to joke about is like a band member will have like a really quote unquote stupid idea but it's actually <laughs> It actually takes less time. In most cases, it takes less time to indulge that band member's stupid idea Mm -hmm. and to have that idea be demonstrated as either a stupid idea or maybe you're surprised and it's actually a great idea. But you could have spent a lot of time arguing with that person, talking them out of trying that idea, in the process probably damaging your working relationship and and sort of breaking down the trust with that person a little bit by talking them out of it um, rather than just trying it and seeing what the result is and seeing if there's actually something cool in their idea that you just didn't couldn't see in advance or you know or maybe it's obvious to them that it wasn't a good idea but then you know then you know because you've gone you've gone through the process and you know that's actually one really good way to build to build trust with someone else if 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 you're willing to sort of indulge their ideas then they're they're more likely to to put a little bit of faith in you because you're showing to them that you're putting faith in them and you know that stuff is all trust is definitely a two way street um, you know this this of course like I I do this but I also one of the most important things that I do in my studio work is watch the clock so I, I scale my contribution to a project based on how much time there is available and so I'm always thinking about that so I will of course sometimes have to shoot things down just as a a factor of how much time there is available. This is a a great thing to talk about because like, you know, if a band is investing a lot of time, so for example, if a company was super invested in a major project and they're like, you know what, this is so important, 
We're going to put a lot of resources into this. Take your time and get it right. You can have a different kind of approach and you can try different ways of being with people versus, hey, you know what? We don't have a lot of money to invest in this. We're tight. We've got to get the best result. And those are different approaches. And you got to, you've got to know what's in your toolbox about how I'm going to motivate things based on what kind of time frame we have. Yeah. I mean, it's all about resource management. But how do you handle it when a band is like impractical around like, hey, we actually have a super tight time frame, but we want you to treat us like we're, you know, like we're the Rolling Stones and we can be in the studio for three months. So one of the privileges that I have as someone who's been recording music for like 25 years and recording projects with fairly established artists, which gets me away from a lot of that that kind of stuff. Like the, the band I'm working with at the moment, you know, they've done probably six albums or so as as this band and prior to that they had done other albums they understand that i want to work an eight hour day and they understand that there's there's limitations to the budget and there's limitations to what i can do within the time frame there's also like limitations to all of our you know ability levels and all that stuff and 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 they get that um it's more it's more commonly the less experienced bands that are you know, unreal, realistic in their demands. You know, the previous band that I worked with actually, you know, great, great band actually, but they, they were sort of unrealistic about their ability to record, um, the album in the amount of time that they, that they booked. Um, but that was all the money that they had in their budget. So they're actually going to have to finish doing the recording part in a DIY kind of way, just because they, just ran out of time. It's really hard for people in the moment to say like, I have to compromise on this. I have to like, I have to live with this guitar sound not being as good as I want it to be, or I have to live with this performance not being as good as I want it to be because I just don't have the time or the money in order to get it right. And that's unfortunate. And one of the things, one of the most challenging things for my work is that recording work is not super profitable. And therefore, I have to have a very, very full schedule, which doesn't allow me a lot of flexibility if my artists do need more time and are, are able to um, pay for a little bit more time if they need more time to work. But also, my, my business is really based around me more than it is based around a facility. And, and anytime you have a service type business like that, it doesn't scale very well. And so I'm currently exploring some ideas that can allow my business to scale a little bit and give me a little bit more flexibility in my schedule for when people need it. Um, Because one of the things I really don't like in business is saying no to my clients. Like I want to be able to accommodate them whenever possible. I don't want to leave people with this sort of sour taste in their mouth because I was the person who said, no, like you can't have it the way you want it because I don't have time or because you don't have money. I don't, I don't want to do that. And, you know, sometimes you have to, but I I really don't want to do that. So I'm kind of exploring some ideas as to how I can delegate to my engineer a little bit better and open up some opportunities for me to be a bit more flexible with my schedule so I can accommodate my clients better. Being in that space, having the long-term relationships you've had with, you know, the other people in Converge, but also with all of these bands you've worked with at God City, like, man, your relationships are significant. They've spanned long periods of time. Like, people care about you. They love you. Speak, people speak very highly of you. But we also know you're going to have down times. You're going to have times of conflict. What's a piece of feedback that you've gotten or something that you've learned about yourself that you were like, yep, I actually have to, I have to change that and that you've been successful in changing, or at least that you've worked hard on. Emotional intelligence, you know, as an only child, not a particularly popular kid in school, I think that I had a, a degree of detachment from other people emotionally, and that wasn't really serving me well in my artistic endeavors or my relationships or, or my work with my clients. And uh, particularly like when recording singers, it's, it's really important to connect with those people on an emotional level because, you know, their, their instrument is their body and the sounds that they're making are lyrics that are, you know, very, or hopefully very heartfelt. So the psychology of working with singers and the emotional intelligence needed to do that is a really important skill that a lot of technically minded people, you know, like myself or other recording engineers don't have. So it's it's something that I've that I've really worked hard on over the past sort of say 
15 years or so. And cohabitating in romantic relationships has been really helpful for that mm. as well, uh, which I, you know, I didn't do when I was, when I was younger. Yeah, that, that's been the main thing for me. Can I share uh, what I think is a funny story? Sure. Um, so when I finished uh, the most recent record that I did, I uh, recorded it with a guy named Jesse Gander out here, who's an incredible engineer, producer, wonderful guy. Is that Rain City? Yeah, Rain City. Um, yeah, great. So we finished the recording and it took me forever, man. It took me forever. I actually had to go to a different studio to do the vocals because it was taking me so long. And when I finished it, it was just as like, you know, emotionally, I put everything into this recording, everything. I paid money for the recording, everything. It felt like I was like completing 19 college degrees all at the same time. And then Jesse was like, wow, man, that was like a really hard earned 19 minutes. And I was like, 19 minutes? He said, yeah, your record's only 19 minutes long. And then apparently the look on my face was just absolute horror. And Jesse started laughing so hard. And that's that emotional intelligence point where I was like, how dare you laugh at my pain? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, he still tells the story now. And we, we totally uh, like laugh about it. But I remember thinking, it's like, damn, that's cold. You laughed at me in that moment. <laughs> but it's hilarious. And he should have laughed because apparently I look like someone just walked over my grave. I mean, I would probably do that too. There's, there's like... <laughs> You know, a well-timed joke is also really important when you need to kind of diffuse the um, <laughs> the tension in the room. Yeah. But you got you got to like, yeah, you got to scale that based on who you're working with and what their temperament is. You know, there's people there's people who respond well to like being beat up in the studio, and there's other people who do not at all. Okay, man, let's let's take a shift towards your uh, other parts of your um, your business world because, of course, converges. We did a big push on that, and we naturally went into God City. God City is real interesting because you just started, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, you just started in a teeny little space that was maybe your first house. Is that correct? Um, my parents' garage, actually. Wow. Uh, that didn't last very long. And then I moved into sort of a punk house with a bunch of friends and had a studio in the basement and did some recording there. Like a, a Converges record, When Forever Comes Crashing, was done there. And the Cabin record, Until Your Heart Stops, was done there. And then I moved into a kind of a commercial space that was um, in a old industrial complex uh, for about five years. 2002, I bought the building in Salem, Massachusetts, where I currently reside, and gutted it and built a studio there. If you think back two years, five years, 10 years, so two years ago, five, year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, what are you doing now differently from a business perspective that you weren't doing, let's say two years ago, five years ago, or 10 years ago, and you don't have to hit all three, but just if you kind of reflect back, what's markedly different, like what's noticeably different that you do as a business person? Well, the trajectory that I'm on now, I would say started almost exactly 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I had a, let me back up for a second. I hate business. I hate money. It's like, I want a lot of money just so I don't have to think about money. It's not something that I'm motivated <laughs> by. What I'm motivated by is getting to do the stuff that I want to do and not being stressed out. Right. So back about 10 years ago, I had a slow summer at the studio, which has been unusual for me. It's probably the only time that I didn't have a lot of, a lot of business for a period of time. It also coincided with my father having a slow summer at his shop. He's a machinist. He owns a, a CNC machine shop nearby. Around that time period, a bunch of friends had been asking me about helping them build guitars out of parts. So there's a number of different companies that sell just sort of guitar parts, and you can put together your own guitar. And so I'd, I had been helping people do that. It got me thinking, you know. A lot of these parts I could build myself. I could have my own body shapes that had, like, the God City logo on them and I could sell these to friends or I could help friends build these things to their spec and it would be of the same quality but it would be a little bit more unique and it would be you know it would have my flair my styling on it and I, I found that I really enjoyed that process so I I designed a bunch of guitar shapes and I started I oh I, I should mention I have a background in actual engineering so like I went to school for aerospace engineering and worked as a biomedical engineer and and prior to that, my father would employ me as a draftsman sometimes. So I, you know, I've been using AutoCAD since the mid '80s. Currently, I use SolidWorks, but I've got some CAD skills. And so, designing um, a solid body guitar is not really 
that complicated. So I did some solid body guitar designs and was able to build the bodies and the pick guards and the bridges at my father's shop. I ordered off the shelf necks and started, you know, painting them myself and sold about 30 something guitars to friends of mine before I realized that, you know, the business was picking back up and I was more interested in the design work than I was in the um, sort of the artisan side of building guitars, like the the sanding of lacquer was not really something that I enjoyed and was and wasn't particularly good at, but I I did enjoy designing the guitar quite a lot. So kept working on that stuff, and eventually you know studio business picked back up, and 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 I tried several different OEM manufacturers for the guitars, and you know got another twenty or so built with different OEMs, and it took about the next 10 years of searching actually before I found um, the right manufacturing partner for my guitar business. So in the past year or so, I've um, I've been manufacturing guitars. I've done about 100 in the last year, a little over 100 in the last year, and I have another big batch on the way. And that's been really rewarding, uh, really, really eye-opening in a lot of ways. And also, actually, it, you know, it's been eye-opening in a way that harkens back to an earlier question where as I've been sort of designing guitars for other people, I've realized that taste is in the eye of the beholder, right? So decisions that are so obvious to me or, or so obviously correct or so obviously wrong to me are just other people respond to things in different ways. Like for me, like I would never put a pearloid pick guard on any guitar yet for other people like all they want is a pearloid pick guard or, you know, little things like that or different types of pickups or tuning machines or scale lengths of necks or nut widths or all these things that people feel very strongly about. I have different opinions about, but, but in building custom guitars for people, I realized that there is a lot of merit in the ideas that other people had and that I was not the only person in the, in the world and other people's um, tastes and other people's usages of these tools were were of equal importance to how I would use them. Mm. So so things started progressing. And then about five years ago, um, I caught the guitar pedal bug. So mm. I went to um, this music convention called NAM, which I think stands for North American Music Makers Convention, but it's basically a giant trade show that happens in Anaheim every year, and all the different music manufacturers get together and show their wares, and all the store buyers are there, and it's a, just a big like industry meetup kind of thing. And in going there, I thought, you know what would be cool is if I had a really memorable business card to hand out to people. So I talked to my friend Nick, who um, owns an amp company called Dunwich Amps, about this idea, and he ended up designing a a PCB printed uh, printed circuit board uh, business card for me. So it's it's the size and shape of a business card, but it's um, you know full of a bunch of holes and electrical connections. So that if you want to, you can build your own distortion pedal for a guitar by populating um, this business card with a bunch of electrical components. <laughs> Um, and so that that thing actually kind of went went viral. There was all these like tech blogs that yeah. picked it up, and it became this like huge yeah. thing. And I I you know originally just made like a hundred of them. I figured I'd give them out to people at trade shows or like if a some other nerd saw me at a show and asked for one, I'd give it to them. Um, mm -hmm. But it became this like huge thing, and everybody wanted them. So I I, I started having um, Deathwish distribute them, and I you know I sold them for like seven bucks, mm -hmm. and um, it became this really popular thing. And it it um, it's since sold, I don't know, four or 5,000 units now. It's, it's wild. Um, I got the bug of building guitar pedals through that. Mm -hmm. um, previously in college, I had had, I'd actually struggled a bit with electronic, electrical engineering in college, but, and I'd always had a bit of like a learning barrier with it. And in getting excited about this guitar pedal thing, I was kind of able to overcome my learning barrier about electronics. And I've become, a, you know, a lot more knowledgeable as a result. And and now I've actually designed probably hundreds of different guitar pedals. Um, I have a my guitar company. I've I've now branded God City Instruments, and I also sell guitar pedals and DIY PCBs of all sorts of different circuits uh, under that moniker. And it's become actually a a viable income stream for me now. So it's 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 really exciting that I that's how I've been able to scale my or one of the ways that I've been able to scale my business a little bit is to get away from only providing the service of 
engineering and producing records to providing you know physical goods for other people that are creating music yeah and you know i want to go back to something you said earlier because you said it and i kind of chuckled to myself because I, I think it's true when you're like I, man, I actually hate money and i hate dealing with it I, I just want to have money so i don't have to worry about money so when i think of business and, and being a business person and building a business so like what i've done with cadence nothing to do with money i, I couldn't i couldn't care less it's more about being able to follow my intellectual curiosity and being able to help people. That's like a big thing for me, being able to help people, give people a platform, like help reduce suffering, um, all of this stuff. Yeah. So like if you had, if, if you, if all of your needs were, were provided for, would you still do your job? I, I would still help people. I'd probably go back into the, the pure therapy world. Um, but yeah, like I would for sure, without a doubt, that's just what I do. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't make every single record that I make, but I would still absolutely make records if all of my financial needs were met through other means. So that's why, like, again, when I think of God City or I think of God City Instruments or I think of Converge, it's like, yeah, there's money in play. And sometimes there's a little bit and sometimes there's a lot. One of the things that's always stood out to me about the story there is it's easier to do good business when you're really actually just doing what you do anyways you're just passionate and you're just figuring out the best way to do it so that you can do it as long as you can in the best way possible yeah i that's 100 percent true yeah i mean if converge was losing money that would be tough but so long as we're not paying out of pocket i mean i definitely remember the times where we would take turns filling the gas tank mm -hmm. to go on tour um to do that now would be would be pretty tough for us but um as long as we're as long as we're not losing money, we're still going to be happy to play together. Totally, man. And like, you know, of course, like with the pandemic that just uh, that we're still in. I mean, I know that must have been difficult for different members of the band in different ways because I know you all have different ways of doing it. One of the things that I think is really cool from the idea of scaling up is that you really have approached things in a natural way. Nothing's forced, but you have built up multiple revenue streams so that money's not the concern it's the well i want to do things that i want to do in a way that's fulfilling to, towards me and that's a pretty miraculous thing for someone to do on a relatively small scale because you aren't in the rolling stones you're in converge and you have a successful studio that's really based off of something you started in your parents garage and you have a, an instrument company just because you decided hey that'd be fun to do these are all things that you've scaled up in an effective way, like a true business person without money being the thing that you're chasing. It's about like fulfilling your interest and following your passion. And that's really why I wanted to talk to you today. Well, and I think that my audience, my audience can sense that, mm -hmm. you know, I have, totally. I have a pretty good organic reach on the, on the socials or whatever, but yeah, and I think the fact that my, my audience can sense that this comes from my own passion for doing things. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that I respect their passion too, um, is what enables it to be a thing. And if I just came out of nowhere and started slinging guitars, people might be distrustful of me, but because I come from this music community and I'm, and I'm slinging guitars to this music community, it's, um, it's received a lot better than it would be from some faceless corporation. Totally, man. And the other thing is like in this community, although your influence straddles multiple communities, it's still a relatively small amount of the population. Your footprint is a respected footprint because of the way you've carried yourself. And that's, again, why I wanted to talk to you. So I got three questions as we're closing off. The first is tell us your best Aerosmith story and what that means for someone who might who might not know. Oh, Aerosmith, dude. <laughs> um <laughs> Well, so, you know, I'm from the Boston area. Aerosmith is definitely the, was historically the every man's band around here. And, you know, they'll play four nights sold out at Fenway Park or whatever. They've somewhat been replaced by Dropkick Murphys and Godsmack, mm. but not quite. They're still Aerosmith. But yeah, everybody around here has got some sort of Aerosmith story. Like everybody's cousins married to the bass player's sister or something like that. I, I have a number of Aerosmith stories. I think I'll tell you my most recent one. I was buying a car a couple years ago, and the guy that I was buying the car from, you know, was asking me what I what I do for a living, and which, you know, I never like talking about that, because whenever you tell someone you're a musician, they've always got something weird to say. Um, and so I, you know, I told him and he was like, oh yeah, you know, Aerosmith. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I know Aerosmith. He's like, yeah, I sold a, I sold a couple of cars to Joey Kramer. Like last time he came in, he like, 
traded in a mini Koopa, and I asked him to sign the dashboard. He wouldn't do it, the fucking prick. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. Okay, okay, second question for you. Long term, you've been a long term music guy. You also love music. We're involved in, in something like punk and hardcore, and very specifically, like, like we're talking hardcore here. What's one, two, or even three bands that nobody knows about that meant something to you in your journey up? Ooh. Well, we'll start with Soul Side. Mm. Well, um, people know about Soul Side, though. Come okay. on. Well, so, Okay, well, what, who, who's our audience here? <laughs> well, you know? uh, that's going to be my next question. Like, we pull audience that, from all over the place, including punk and hardcore. But okay, so the last the last band that I recorded, I literally don't know a single band that they referenced, and they don't know a single band that I referenced. It was the weirdest. I mean, we're about twenty years apart, um, but it was a really weird thing. I, I feel like when people get involved in a music genre, they tend to know about what's current. And they tend to know about like the sort of the foundation of their genre, but they don't tend to know about anything in between, which is which is really interesting. So I love to when I when I like love an artist, I love to kind of take a deep dive and try to try to understand who their influences are. And that's always been really interesting to me to go to go like, oh, that's where they got it from. But hmm, let me let me think for a second obscure stuff that is important to me okay um uh navio forge oh good one uh dive from massachusetts Mm -hmm. um daf daf who are they they are um it was a Deutsche Amerikanische Francais or something like that i've always just called them daf they're they're sort of they're this german Maybe they're like the German version of Suicide. It was just a two-piece, like singer and then electronics and sometimes real drums type of thing, but very like ranty. It was a sort of a predecessor to really all the post-punk stuff. They were a German band, but they moved to the UK in the late 70s and had a big influence on bands like Joy Division, Mm -hmm. bands like Birthday Party, and... You know, current bands like say like Idols or like Viagra Boys probably owe a lot to them in their lineage, even if those bands are not specifically directly influenced by them. Mm. Well, I like I like that last answer a lot. If you check them out, check out the live stuff more than the studio stuff because they were a lot more unhinged live. Mm. Uh, I can guarantee you, I will not check this out. But I think Alex, <laughs> who's sitting across from me, will. She's been nodding with great approval. Okay. Uh, uh, as you as you said this, uh, it, you know it's funny that Navio Forge record. I loved it when it came out, and then you know, probably around like late '90s, early 2000s, I became real dismissive of it, and I was like, whatever, you know, that's so lame. And actually, Nate and I were talking about it, and Nate was like, dude, I'm gonna no, I'm talking some sense in you. You have to re-listen to that record. It's totally great. And I was like. You know, I was kind of like in like maybe like my peak youth crew phase where I was like, I cried at the studio or whatever. But you know what? That's a slamming record. That's a great record. So thank you, Nate. You did me a solid there. Pretty much all the Sarah Kirsch records are incredible. And that one is one of the least appreciated. And it's one that, or at least on the East Coast. So it's one that like didn't get any distribution here. For some reason, like you could find it. Um, in the discount bin and like any record store in the Southeast, but in the Northeast that just didn't exist because this was all like, you know, pre Discogs, pre, pre eBay. Well, cause it was, it was on some label that I think that was its only release, like spirit something. I can't remember what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You're, I think you're right. It might've been maybe one of the band members or one of their friends or something just put out the one record. And like, let me echo like Sarah Kirsch, like I, I think literally every record is a killer record. Oh, I yeah. can't think of one that, that wasn't great. All right, last question, man. Um, and I said this to you when I asked you to be on the podcast. It's a leadership podcast, and we have people, all sorts of different kinds of people in here that, that I think are, are leaders. A leader doesn't mean like, oh, I'm the CEO of a company. I just feel like a leader is like someone who's an initiator who like takes it, who's not afraid to take a leap or who is afraid to take a leap but takes it anyways. So we've got people who come to the podcast from the business world, and we've got artists, we've got musicians, people from punk and hardcore, people from 
all sorts of different music uh, styles, but they all come here because they've got an interest in leadership and what that can mean in their world. So I'm going to ask you a big question. And there's no no wrong answer here, but from your perspective, if you think of of your life and your career and how you've managed yourself, what are your reflections on what does leadership mean to you? Well, it's such a big question. Leadership as it pertains to my life manifests in a lot of different ways. In terms of the music that I'm involved in, I'd say there's a decentralized leadership that happens, a division of labor, if you will. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, in my band Converge, like I do a lot with the songwriting and the recording. You know, our singer Jake does a lot with the visuals and the record label stuff. The people that are involved in like the business side of the band, like our lawyer, our booking agents, our record labels, et cetera, those are all people that come from inside of our music community. And so having a community with no sort of overarching leader, but with trust in individuals within that collective to take on leadership responsibilities for certain aspects of the collective has been uh, a really important thing to me and sort of an overarching guiding, guiding principle in my life and in my relationships. And I think, you know, we're thinking about like equality in any kind of relationship, whether it's like a domestic relationship or a relationship with the other people in your communities, being willing and accepting to let anyone lead when that person is the best suited person for the job, I think is, I think is really important. In my sort of day-to-day -day life at my studio, I do have one person working under me who's um, named Zach Weeks, and he's a very talented engineer, very talented musician, and talented at a lot of things, actually. And I think my job as a leader here is to facilitate him to be self-directed. So, you know, mm. be providing him, making sure that he always has something on his plate for him to be doing and, and helping give some guidance to keep him productive, but also keep him self self-directed in that in that work that he does um, related to the studio. I don't know if you this has come up on your podcast before, but what you are doing right now and what we're doing together here is actually th a form of thought leadership. You know, the the guests, what you're, what you're doing through your podcast and bringing on guests to share their experience and uh, to contribute to the hive intelligence and knowledge about concept of leadership is a form of thought leadership. And I think I've, I've done this certainly a lot with music and with recording and the various um, podcasts that I've been on, or just, you know, just making a post about how to mic a guitar amp or things like that, or the, or the, the different types of um, online tutorials that I've been a part of. All that stuff kind of contributes to the, the hive intelligence of the craft and I'm I'm happy to be considered one of one of many thought leaders in that field. So first of all, thanks for saying that. I the whole point of this podcast for me, you know, some I, when we first started, I, I was real nervous about it because I was like, oh, I just don't want to be some corny dork who's like out here talking about it. But I just feel like there's so many people that you or I know or or that I've come across in 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 my therapeutic practice or I've come across in the business world who are just like. I just want you to say what you just said to me, but to a broader audience, because I think it can really help people do right by other people. And when I think of leadership at the end of the day, it's like, I want to make sure that I'm living the happiest life that I, that I can lead and help other people do that. Like healthy, happy life, whether it's like in, in their work or whatever. Yeah. It's a bit hard to share knowledge without sort of feeling pompous sometimes you know yes yeah man yeah yeah and this that that kind of like adding to the the discourse about it that's really like the goal and this is why i why i do this and i would love to have a podcast where i talk about like youth of today all day of course i would because i love like punk and hardcore and i love bad brains and minor threat and all this stuff but that's there's a lot of great podcasts for that and that's not where my passion lies yeah you, you just have to you just have to think of your knowledge that you're sharing as part of a continuum Mm, and totally. not the not the be all end all it's Absolutely. just sort of adding to the vocabulary adding to the knowledge base of your craft well listen kurt this has been an amazing conversation uh, i feel like i could talk about this with you and and have and probably will continue to offline uh for a long time um there's been so much great stuff uh as we're closing off is there anything that you want to add in um be good to each other get vaccinated <laughs> 
<laughs> right on. Okay, everybody, we will see you in the outro. And Spencer, drop the beat. That was a great conversation, Kurt. Thank you so much for being on the show. You know, I first met Kurt in more of a real way rather than just in passing. One of my bands was recording in Salem with him. And we were walking down the street before we actually got into the studio, uh, going out for lunch. And I was already struck by what an interesting guy that he was. His manner of kind of articulating himself is like really clear, really direct. Maybe sometimes in the studio, slightly harsh. But just underneath all of that is this person with like a deep intellect, a really, really good soul and a total heart of gold. What he's done in business and uh, artistically is, I think, a game changer for a lot of people. You know, like from a business perspective, listening to him today, a lot of people, whether it's just like normal corporate business or people who are more involved in the artistic realm, there's a lot of stuff you can pattern yourself off of there. And also from the artistic space, just the integrity of Kurt and also of Converge, it's just so unquestionable. And for me, like very, very inspiring about how you can rise through the ranks and really have this established band but it never becomes about something that it should. It always stays about the same thing that it should be about, which is like the pursuit of that artistic endeavor. So really, really inspirational conversation, Kurt. I, I really appreciate it. I'm your host, Aram Arslanian, and this has been One Step Beyond. One Step Beyond.